Herbert Hill was labor director of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is the premier civil rights organization in the United States from 1951 to 1977. And 1951 to 1977, of course, is the epoch of the civil rights revolution that we associate with Dr. Martin Luther King. The NAACP was the leading American civil rights organization going all the way back to its formation in 1909. It was mostly a legally focused organization that made lawsuits. They were behind Brown versus Board of Education, which desegregated supposedly American schools in 1954. And Hill was a link between the labor movement, the trade unions, and the NAACP uh, as labor director. And when he first got involved in that sort of activity, he was very pro-labor and pro-union and thought of the union movement as one vehicle for black integration into American society of black racial equality with whites because the unions organized in the 1930s in steel and auto and rubber industries and so forth, basic industries, had to organize inclusively in order to get these shops organized. But Hill became a very acid critic of unions for not breaking down enough racial distinctions in job categories. Blacks often had the lowest paid, hottest, dirtiest work in factories uh, and not <clears throat> sufficiently advancing blacks within the union hierarchy. And eventually became a very scalding critic of labor unions. So he's a, he's a major figure in labor history and a major figure in civil rights history because he played this critical role between those two movements at the height of the civil rights movement. In my own research in, in American social movements, I had occasion to interview Herbert Hill before he died, and I was very familiar with his life story. And one day, I was looking through the FBI's online files. All the files that they release for Freedom of Information purposes are now digitized and available on their website. There's volumes and volumes and volumes of it. Not, nobody could possibly read it all. But I happened to be reading a file, and it was from two of J. Edgar Hoover's top men internal security officials in Washington. And they were referring to somebody in New York who had reliably informed for the FBI when agents contacted him. It's male, short name, blacked out, top labor official at the NAACP, had been a socialist and a member of a socialist organization until 1949 which was the year that Herbert Hill had told me in a tape-recorded interview that he had left this small socialist group he was part of. Uh, and it's one of those feelings you just get where the time, the place, New York, the man, the post he's in, there was no other labor official at the NAACP. The coincidence of him being in the socialist organization and leaving in 1949 is clearly Herbert Hill. The file doesn't say Herbert Hill because the FBI redacts information that would compromise its uh, agents and informants. Part of my heart sank because Herbert Hill, he's a controversial figure. Many labor historians believe that he was unfair to organized labor in the kind of relentless criticism that he offered. He more or less came to the view that because of labor's bias toward seniority, that it was objectively racist. Because if you, if blacks in American work life are the last hired and first fired, then they're not going to have seniority and their jobs aren't going to be as protected and seniority becomes something beyond normal protection of a, a aged worker, it becomes the protection of white workers. He may have been unduly harsh toward unions, 
But he also was a hero to many for trying to open up the American workplace to black workers on an equal basis. And to discover that he had cooperated repeatedly with the FBI, naming the names of radicals and socialists he had known in the 1940s in his youth, uh, and had done so knowing he was cooperating with the FBI, because the documents are quite clear that he expressed worry that the FBI might go to the NAACP and tell them about his former radical association. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit disheartening. The FBI was an all-white organization at the time. The FBI was run by J. Edgar Hoover, who was hostile to the civil rights movement and who actually ordered wiretapping extensively on Martin Luther King and believed Martin Luther King was probably an agent of the communists. So it's that peculiar paranoia of the American anti-communist imagination that would lead to wiretapping on King and, and also then trying to gather political information on dissident socialists of this kind. But with that information came a lot of consequences. People lost jobs. Uh, people were deported uh, if they were immigrants. Uh, people were called before investigative committees and so forth. So uh, even if they were no threat and even if the motivation against them was sometimes because they were supporters of black civil rights, which we would now think of as human rights, uh, the consequences could be quite devastating in their lives. The FBI, in trying to divide the NAACP from the Committee to Aid the Monroe Defendants, thought that if they called Hill on the phone, and gave him an earful about the Committee to Aid the Monroe Defendants, it would help stir things up in the NAACP. Why? Because Hill himself had once been in the SWP and knew exactly what it was and what it was about and wouldn't need much of an education on that. And they took him to be opposed to its politics because he'd cooperated with them over the years. So they placed an anonymous call to him. Now this is interesting because it's an anonymous call. If it's an anonymous call, they are not assuming that Hill will go along with undermining a group just because it's associated with the SWP. They're not using him as an agent. They're, they're, they're not willing to go from seeing him as an informant on his doorstep to trying to actually overtly manipulate him as, as a, a doer of what they want. Instead, they're using an anonymous call because they know about him and can assume that he'll respond and react in a certain way. Uh, and they were eventually satisfied that it had worked. They thought there was a rapprochement occurring between the NAACP and the Committee to Aid the Monroe Defendants. They thought that they were starting to cooperate and that the NAACP might even be uh, willing to make a financial donation their way. Now, this may have just been a, fan a paranoid fantasy on their part because I think the NAACP was probably pretty aware of what was going on in Monroe and was not wanting to be involved in it. Uh, but in any case, for a time, there was some talk that this might materialize into a cooperative relationship. And after the call was placed to Hill, uh, you know, w within months, they were hearing no such further talk. So. One of the things that was brought home to me by discovering this is that it can be anybody. Anybody can be an FBI informer. We think of, the, of, of FBI agents when we think of informers, but you can be a very sincere and dedicated and effective activist for change and at the same time be informing to the FBI. That's the paradox here. <laughs>